This episode is sponsored by My Cat Chunk. I will tongue kiss Bill before I let that tramp in my house. Whoa. Horror has a face, but that face is sometimes deeply attractive. And if you are to know horror, then you must climb into bed with it, peer into the lazy eyes of that gleefully indifferent monster, and never, ever blink. Luann's mother, Leanne, is a monster. The life that Luann must have endured in that trailer with Leanne and Hoyt as parents is indescribable. From visits from the social worker to puppet therapy to the mango-colored palazzo pants that made her butt look like a DeviantArt character, <laughs> Luann's life has been so dark that it has been effectively blacked out from ever showing up in the show. I wonder where Daddy has been all this time. Tonight we are going to look through our family photo album together. And because of that intense darkness, this episode is in a very weird place for a show like King of the Hill. With stuff like The Simpsons and Rick and Morty, alcohol abuse is just part of their comedic bones, something that we can dismiss and laugh at and go, ho ho ho, those crazy drunks, look at all the self-destructive antics they get up to, ha 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 ha, all while we take a big sip from the Costco-sized rain barrel of mead. But because this storyline focuses so heavily on Luann's tragic past, you can't really make alcoholism the big butt of the joke here, which is admittedly a tough set of circumstances for the writers as it puts a lot of restrictions and sinkholes out there for them to fall into. Because really, how can you realistically depict someone reuniting with their abuser in a way that feels palatable and perhaps even a little funny while also not trivializing the whole thing? Well, typically, King of the Hill will merge the character's sorrow in with something wacky, something that just gives us time to digest the problem and the emotions. Take, for example, the time Bill learned that he was part of a secret government program. As if it wasn't bad enough that Bill learned he was secretly being tested on, he then discovered that all the shitty parts of his life that he thought were just, oh, that's part of the government's whole thing. No, that's actually on you, Bill. You're at fault for all the failings that make you gross. This world-shattering revelation was then also piggybacked onto with Bill's decision to pilot the big tank that they were in away from his friends and to an almost certain death. A death that he's gonna, like, burn to death. He's gonna blow up and and that's how, like, the direction we're going with this comedy show? Wow! And what, pray tell, did that episode do to balance out that boatload of traumatic baggage? They called it Operation Infinite Walrus. Their mission? Headaches and erectile dysfunction. See, now that is just silly and stupid and ridiculous enough to give the plot's darker undertones a big emotional pass from the audience. But Leanne's saga decided to go down a very different path. Instead of giving us something stupid to distract us from Leanne's awfulness, it instead decided to embrace the problem, even going so far as to hype up Leanne's arrival to an insane degree. The way everyone in the neighborhood talks about Leanne, from the mildly uncomfortable to the outright terrified, it feels as if there's a disaster just on the horizon. She's coming to visit on Saturday. Uh, she's coming here? Luann's mama's coming to visit. <laughs> That woman is a menace to society. All this terrified talk elevates Leanne to the status of fucking Godzilla, as if she's this force of nature that can't be stopped, when in reality all she is is a sad drunk and a bad mother. Well, hey everybody, welcome to the party! Hey, here she is! And before we start mapping out this excellent plot in my typical excruciating detail, I want to say how stupendous Pamela Adlin is as Leanne in this episode. Pamela is rightfully praised for her work as Bobby, but boy, <laughs> the Leanne performance has something special. An extra bit of sauciness and slurring that really makes this thing sing. Well, where's the damn food? Did fungus for brains already gobble it all up? I think it's because Pamela is able to make Leanne sound very sweet and tender in one scene and then later twist her voice into a bitter snarl. And not to get ahead of ourselves, but just listen to this howl of rage. It's magnificent. You can let go of my hand. <laughs> now that is the sound of the devil at your heels. Dang. But all right then, enough butt kissing of the voice actors. Let's get into it. Uh, the episode, that is. I am going to go close up the mustard before it crusts. If you'll excuse me. 
We begin with a mother-daughter night at the Beauty Academy of all places, one where Peggy and Luann are looking out at the happy families from the darkness of their car. By staging our characters in this way, we're allowed to get in on their private conversation and their private thoughts and understand that the current arrangement is uncomfortable and not how they'd like them to be. I don't think Mama would want anyone to take her place. Well, unless they took her place in prison. But I guess that's too much to ask. So let's address this right off the bat. Peggy, sweet Peggy, is a goddamn superstar in this thing. Besides Peggy's ego and her three-peat of the Substitute Teacher of the Year award, I would say that her protectiveness for the people that she loves is one of her biggest character-defining traits, and is a trait that is able to persist even into the later seasons where the rules and canon of the show get admittedly a little blurred. And while Hank and Bobby only occasionally need Peggy's help in day-to-day -day happenings, Luann is the one who's in the most vulnerable position of all, and Peggy is willing to do double duty as both a supportive aunt and someone Luann can go to when she's in need of a mother figure in her life. Oh. I would love to see your show, Luann. Great! You could save a seat for Mama in case she changes her mind. It's really interesting how Peggy isn't doing what we might expect of her, where she like barges in where she isn't needed and makes a big show of her presence, but instead she is rather humbly offering to be someone that Luann can count on. Which then makes the situation really sad when Luann cheerfully turns down Peggy's offer, hoping against hope that her mother will come through for her. And when she doesn't, Luann's disappointment certainly shows itself in some uh, <laughs> interesting ways. Oof, that manger baby recreation of the stabbing is, uh, <laughs> quite something, my goodness. It's only shown for a brief moment, but my god, are the implications horrifying. You never want to walk in and see your parents forking. <laughs> but there I go, jumping ahead of myself, as if I'm in the heartwarming classic, This Is How You Lose the Time War. Hoo-hoo, <laughs> so good. But anyway, let's draw all of this back to the beginning, where Hank is christening his new workbench. What should we build first, son? Well, how about a go-kart? Okay. First, we'll work out the design flaws of your go-kart by building a TV cabinet. Ah, the classic parent question, asked only to give the appearance of a choice. Oh, 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 takes me back. But before I'm able to go off on yet another tangent about my tiresome personal life, Luann comes busting in, screeching in a way that makes me really appreciate the excellent sound mixing this show has. <laughs> Seriously, it is not easy to have someone do a full-on yell without blowing out their microphone or having to turn the sound down to the point where you can barely hear them. This is actually really impressive that they're able to do it in this way. I just knew it. I told them medium security would not be enough to hold that woman. Oh, she didn't escape. She was released. Now I want you to take note of this. I want you to get out a little piece of paper and scribble this down. Notice, class, how we are already being conditioned to regard Leanne as dangerous. The Hills assume that Leanne escaped and Peggy's insistence on maximum security implies that Leanne is either very cunning or strong enough to bust out. This Doomer attitude is backed up by Dale's spit-take reaction and Boomhauer's rather haunting recollection of an event that I am very glad we did not have to witness. I tell you what, man, ain't no dang old lady about her, man. They're getting old liquored up, man, on coming on strong up, paw me like a dang old animal, man. I'll tell them no means no. See, now, this is something I really value about King of the Hill. There is clearly a history to these characters, stuff that we have not seen on camera, but are events that nonetheless inform how they think and feel. It's as if we, the viewers, moved into the neighborhood ourselves and are piecing together bits of information from the stories we hear, which then start to form a complete picture. Because at some vaguely defined point in the past, Leanne got drunk and, quote, pawed at Boomhauer like an animal, unquote, and wouldn't take no for an answer. And for someone like Boomhauer, who is something of a uh, lady enthusiast, someone who even goes beyond his sexual appetites is quite notable. But okay, okay, let's address the awkward turtle in the room. Bill says he's never met Leanne as if he's the new neighbor on the block instead of someone who's been a part of Hank's life for at least 30 years. And while I'm all for sacrificing a bit of, you know, hard details for the sake of a meaningful plot, I think this episode could have instead benefited from a very quick and easy line of exposition. Instead of trying to, like, cobble together some big past, they could have just said something like, oh, you know, Bill, you've had your hands full with Lenore. We didn't want to expose you to Leanne's problems, too. Or perhaps, like, Bill, you have met her. You're always just too drunk to 
remember. Something like that, just some little throwaway bit of dialogue would have really, really clarified things and made this all sort of just click together. Plus, a little added benefit here, the whole, uh, Bill, you're always drunk explanation would have tied even stronger to the theme of alcoholism in this episode. So, what I'm saying here is that when this show eventually goes public domain, you know, in like a hundred years or so, I want someone in the future to restructure this scene to fit my very specific complaints. <laughs> yeah! Ow! Oh! My foot! I, I think it's broken! Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of forgot about this. Um, okay, so one weird factor about this episode is that Bill has a very odd and, uh, I have to say, a very disturbingly well-animated problem. Don't be silly. Just let me... Ah! What the... Don't look at me! Don't look at me! Yeah. Oh. I never thought I'd say this, but I don't think I can finish my beer. I mean, seriously, they got some straight-up freaks to animate Bill's foot. <laughs> and not because, like, the foot is very well-shaped or anything, but, like, look how the toes are moving around independently of the others. Ugh. I don't even think, like, a monkey has that kind of dexterity. Christ, that is so creepy to look at. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, Bill has a fungus he's been dealing with for some time, and his friends are actually surprisingly supportive for them. You don't have to be embarrassed about your toes, Bill. It's just a medical condition. Sure, that's what you say. But I don't see you waving your narrow urethra around for everyone to see. See, folks, medical conditions are nothing to be ashamed of. How do I know? Well, because King of the Hill told me so. I myself once had a horrible planter's wart on the bottom of my foot for months, which left me in agony and really ruined that year of high school. Blech. And pro tip, just like how Bill says he's been using a powder for 10 years and hasn't been getting any results, I tried something similar on my planter's wart problem and nothing happened for about seven months. Soaking, re-soaking, applying all this stuff. It sucked, it was awful, it burned all my skin away. It was just awful. Why do you think I look like this? Oh. So instead of using a powder or cream, please use a Band-Aid treatment that comes with Compound W on it, which will really clear up your problem. And hey, Compound W, that sounds like something Hank would use, huh? And my goodness, real talk here, folks. When that Band-Aid, you know, after a week of treatment, pulled away and lifted that thing out of my foot, oh, oh, the relief was divine. So much so that I, I almost want to experience it a second time. Uh, I mean, I hope this information reaches someone out there who needs it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, just, just keep that in mind, folks. It really helps. Anyway, putting all that shit aside, Luann calls her father up and tells him about his newly released spouse. We're never gonna be a family again, Aunt Peggy. He won't forgive Mama. Honey, marriage is about trust. It was like a knife in his heart when she stuck that fork in his back. Oh, and trust me, we will get to Luann's father in a later episode, a much later episode. But for now, I'll just say that I hate, I despise how King of the Hill used Hoyt. How on earth is it possible that Leanne is the better parent of the two? That shouldn't be possible, but unfortunately that's just the fucked up world we live in. But hey, come on, it's not all bad. Let's get some positivity in here. Let's hear how Peggy is cheering Luann up and what exactly she's praising her niece for accomplishing in the time since her mother went to prison. You're in school, you've got a righteous Christian puppet show. You're always so very clean. I just do not want you to get distracted and, and lose your way, honey. Okay, so I could just be reading a little bit too much into this, but I am a bit disturbed how Peggy lists being clean as something worthy of praise. Like, did the girl grow up living in squalor? A dirty child living on the fringe of her parents' attention? Cause it kinda seems pretty likely and is, again, just so damn sad. And adding to the pitifulness, Luann actually does a really good job of putting up welcoming decorations for her mother with a strange emphasis on yellow ribbons. And before Leanne arrives, Hank gives Bobby some very specific survival instructions. Don't make any sudden moves. Don't look her in the eye. And if I give you this signal, run to Dale's house and stay there till I say it's safe. Going by this conversation, we can safely assume that Bobby has not yet met his aunt, or at least has not done so when he was cognizant of his surroundings, which is much more understandable than the whole Bill question, because Bobby was probably just a baby at the time, so we'll give him a pass. <gasps> She's here! 
Ah, and here is something special that I've noticed. After the episode has spent so much time in hyping up Leanne to such a fever pitch, we now have a certain image of what she looks like in our minds, even though we have no idea what exactly she looks like. We know that Boomhauer doesn't like her, so we can presume that she isn't conventionally attractive, and the amount of violence in her past makes us think that she's someone of terrifying strength, plus she's regarded as, quote, trailer trash, so there's a certain sort of, you know, <laughs> big, hulking, scary person being formed in our imagination. But when Luann's mother does finally get here, we are given a very funny mislead. Mama! Lulu! Oh, my sweet baby girlfriend! Thanks for the lift, Alicia. Mm -hmm. All right, then. So making Leanne into a hulking or scary or ugly or whatever kind of person would have been the easy choice and it would have played exactly into what we might expect from a person who went to prison for stabbing their spouse with a dining implement, but I am instead so very glad that they took her design in this very different direction. This look not only serves to disarm us and relieve much of the tension that's been building up, but also has the benefit of showing the audience that even MILFs, the most valuable members of society, can also be bad people. I am so sorry for all the grief I caused you when I was drinking. I am walking with the Lord now, and I know I have found his forgiveness. I just hope I will find yours someday. Well, we'll let you know. It's at this point that we are now witnessing what I'm going to call functional Leanne. She has clearly gotten her act together and restructured her life in a much better way than before, even if there are admittedly some unsettling thoughts still kicking around in her head. <laughs> Oh, you have such a lovely home here. Of course, if somebody turned on a fire hose, it would all be ruined. I'm not sure if that's the jail experience talking, or her general trashiness, or her just weird imagination, which makes it kind of hard to put, like, a, a gauge on how she is, or what sort of, like, character she is, which is good, good, like, leave me guessing, show. I want her to be sort of this mysterious figure, at least at the beginning. I want her to be sort of this thing that we need to unravel, because that makes her all the more intriguing to witness. It's kind of like how I'm not quite sure if my cat Chunk actually loves me or if he's just tolerating my presence. I mean, just look at the scorn on his face. Tell me what you want, Chunk. What do you want from me, baby? How can you just look at me like that? Why won't you love me? <laughs> Any hoozle, as I dry my tears, uh, we hear that Leanne says she has nowhere to stay, which causes her daughter to do what anyone with abandonment issues would do, which is to instantly cling to the parent who is about to slip away just as she came back into Luann's life. Ugh. Oh, mama. I love you so much. I quit school and I'll get a job. Oh, baby. You mean it? Okay, so I have seen some people on certain message boards complain about Peggy's decision here, both in how quick she is to volunteer their house for Leanne to stay in, and how she seemingly contradicts herself later when Peggy complains about Leanne's presence. How long is she going to stay here? I am sick and tired of scrambling around to find nutritious meals that do not require a fork. And while I am normally able to weather the slings and arrows of Peggy's slander, I have to raise a voice against this particular complaint. Yes, Peggy made a snap decision that would negatively affect Bobby and Hank and herself, remember, but Luann was about to flush away all of her hard work at the Beauty Academy and dedicate her young life to propping up Leanne. Leaving Luann to care for her nightmare mother would have been condemning her to heartbreak and, have to say, probably a fork in the back at some point, so of course Peggy's gonna do whatever she can to stop that from happening. Compare this to the very calloused Uncle Hank, who was prepared, if not eager, to wash his hands of the whole mess and let Luann deal with her mother on her own. And I'll get a job! Oh, baby! You mean it? Okay, then. Whoa, whoa, whoa! You will not quit school. So no, this is not Peggy being shitty or contradictory or hypocritical or selfish or whatever. However you want to disparage what Peggy's doing here, this is actually her acting about as selflessly as she ever has. Like, do you understand what's going on here? Do you watch the episode? Do you blind fools get it? You want Peggy to be better? You want her to be kinder to other people? You want to think about other people other than herself? 
Well, fucking here it is. It's right here. I mean, what did Peggy say before? Like, oh, I will tongue kiss Bill before I let that tramp in my house. She hates Leanne with all of her life, and yet she is willing to give Leanne a spot in her house, take her into her house, because guess what? Her love of Luann and her concern for her niece outstrips her freaking hatred for this horrible woman who married her brother. So here you go! This is what it is! This is Peggy acting altruistically! Do you understand? You fucking idiots get it? Do some media appreciation, you fools! Read, damn you! Read! And plus, it's not just Hank's house, it's Peggy's house too. She can invite people in, and if you think not, like, oh, well, you know, she really should have consulted with Hank before, Hank himself has volunteered their place to crazy people without consulting Peggy before. I mean, just look at this! I came here for a football game, not a soap opera. Our mascot sucks! That's it! Let's get out of here before Dub gets back. How many days is he staying with us? Three. So if we're gonna condemn Peggy, then you also have to condemn Hank for doing the exact same crazy shit. But fuck all that noise. Look at Leanne out there lifting two buckets of sand on a shovel. That is at least 80 pounds on one arm. 80 pounds of sand that she has to keep balanced on both ends of the shovel, too. <laughs> no matter her demons, that woman is fucking strong. My goodness. Oh, and real quick, uh, I promise I won't address this again, but I have to say it here. Uh, Leanne is certainly one uh, <laughs> handsome woman. The title of this video reflects both her attractiveness and, as we're about to see, if I were in this situation, my utter helplessness to escape this woman's web. And I mean, hey, you get it? You get it? I use the word weak to both imply an inability to forego emotional dependency and a literal physical weakness to the abuse that she would throw at me. <laughs> Using a word twice to convey two different meanings, you know that's antenna colossus, baby! So there, that thirsty topic has now been put to bed and buried underground. We can now get to the real juicy stuff, which is the collision between two very unexpected worlds. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, hi. You must be Luann's mom, huh? Would you do me? Huh. Yes, sir. While Luann has been living through the beginning pages of Janet McCurdy's Why I'm Glad My Mom Died, Bill has been enduring a journey through Jeff Vandermeer's Finch. You know, because it's it's a story populated with fungus people. Hey, you get it, you get it. Just take one of these pills every day and you'll be good as new. I've, I've been living with this nightmare for 10 years and all I gotta do is take these pills? Yeah, that's right. Bill enduring 10 years of fungal distress and learning that the problem could have been solved by a few simple pills is not only what some trendy embryos call a mood fam, but more commonly is called the penicillin plight. Wait, what was I doing? Oh, right, 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 I'm sorry. I was about to cover the disgusting fact of Bill and Leanne's coitus. What is that clear nail polish? I just love a man who takes care of his feet. Well, you only get two. Okay, as someone who has also been showered with affection by women far beyond the range of my so-called personality, alleged wit, and garbage pail kid looks, I actually share a lot of camaraderie with Mr. Dotrieve here. Perhaps, yes, their coupling is a bit off-putting to witness, but that's only if you're someone who identifies with the antagonist of Peeping Tom, you no-nut November voyeurists. Besides, no one's getting hurt by their private interactions, so what possible problem could there be? Miss Platter, where is this mother you've been going on and on about? Oh, she's on her way. Oh, right. Their uh, workbench workout comes at the cost of blowing off Luann's mother-daughter day at the Beauty Academy. Ouch. And while Luann's situation is already sad enough, the writers decided to twist the knife by having her teacher recreate the same reaction that I always had when a student said they couldn't turn in their assignment tonight because of something stupid, like their dog getting drafted into the puppy bowl, or having every aunt, uncle, grandparent, and goldfish they ever had die on a bus, which was, oh, I can't believe it, also carrying the paper that they were about to turn in just right now that night, oops. Oh, she's on her way. Yeah, sure. So I was going to put in that clip of Hank saying, oh, what a bitch, but mocking the existence of someone's mother requires ooh, hoo, hoo, a much stronger response than that. So here is me doing my own seething read of Hank's classic line. Ho oh, ho, what a bitch. Zoinks, what a bitch. <laughs> what a bitch. Row, what a bitch. 
<laughs> Goodness, what a bitch. But let's focus our attention away from that whole weird thing that I just did and onto something more pleasant, such as this gloriously awkward moment and Leanne's kick ass robe. Morning. 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 <laughs> Morning. <gasps> Morning. And like everything to do with Bill, a nice romance can't just be nice all around. Part of this is Bill's nature as an emotional black hole, which consumes affection and spits out rude radiation, but it's also because of the inherently conflict-driven format of the show. Bill can't be happy in the long term because being miserable is the Lazarus pit from which all other Bill jokes come from. This isn't like with Dale, where his thing is like, oh, conspiracy theories and weird like ideas about the government. That whole stuff can happen regardless of his mood, whether he's like manic or depressed or happy or sad or whatever. That's just something that can happen no matter what. Bill is a lot like Barney from The Simpsons. The one gag around their character is so key as to what makes them notable and useful to the show that taking it away in the long term is effectively killing off their character's usefulness in the show, at least if the writers don't replace it with something else, which, by the way, is not an original idea that I had about Barney. That's actually something that I got from watching the great YouTube channel, The Real Gems, who does a lot of really good uh, Simpsons reviews out there. So please, if you haven't seen The Real Gems, go check him out. He's a legend in his own right, and I love that guy to death. He's got such a great style, and so he's so smart. Go watch him. Don't watch me. Go watch that guy. He's amazing. But this sort of gets at a larger problem with Bill as a character because, unlike Dale and unlike Barney from The Simpsons, Bill is not doing one specific thing that's sort of funny. It's not the conspiracy theory, it's not the drinking. Bill's whole thing is that he's miserable, he's disgusting, he's very, like, sort of in his own hubris, he's pathetic. That's, like, a lifestyle thing going on with him. So if you change that, if you give him Leanne and suddenly now, like, he's stepping up, he's being a better person, he's actually happier, that's taking away a lot of what makes Bill a really funny and useful character. And yes, that could all potentially pay off, but if you're the writer, specifically this early in the show's sort of lifespan, you have to ask yourself, is it worth the risk? Is it worth gambling taking away the funniest part of a character and instead replacing it with something which might work, which might make sense for the long-term growth of a character, but isn't actually that funny or has the potential to not be as funny as when Bill was actually just really miserable? Think of all the great Bill being sad or gross jokes out there, and now imagine they were all taken away, and now he's got like some big family thing going on it's like yes that's interesting for bill but where's the funny where's the laugh why did we take that gamble in the first place therefore it's best to sort of return him to zero constantly and keep him in that state of eternal misery but even with all those big meta concerns swirling around our minds it is still crazy to me that bill goes on to admit this to hank dang it at this rate my new workbench is never going to get used no oh, it got used last night huh Right after we took a little ride on your mower. Oh! Yeah, imagine telling your best friend that you fucked their sister-in-law on their workbench and on their mower. Like, who needed to know that information, Bill? Sheesh. Okay, so let's now try to ignore Leanne's absolutely colossal dump truck for a moment. Uh, <laughs> guess we know where her daughter got that from, huh? Uh, and instead focus on what Luann is actually saying about what happened with the whole, like, oh my gosh, I missed you at the mother-daughter event at the Beauty Academy. I got so scared when you didn't show up. I thought you started drinking again and got in an accident or a gunfire. <sighs> Notice how Luann isn't even really upset that her mom blew her off, she's just worried for her mother's safety and, you know, that she's not falling into her old ways, and I have to say, that's a freaking good kid right there. She really honestly does love and care about her mom, so good on you, Luann. But it's also lucky for Leanne that her daughter is so kind at heart, so trusting, because those are the kind of people who are easiest to manipulate with a little strategy that I like to call playing the victim. Billy is the first good thing to happen to me since I met your daddy. After all I've been through, don't you want me to be happy? Of course I do. Yeah, Luann, why can't you see what you're doing to your mother? It's your selfish demands that are forcing her to be miserable. Why can't you just for once let her be happy instead of forcing her to do what makes her miserable, which is being with you? So selfish. Thank God Bill is there to take Leanne out of that abusive household and instead go on a big, brassy, sexy montage set to the fabulous Thunderbirds' Wrap It Up. Now, if I were a less, um, well, let me choose my words carefully here. If I were a less, 
a sympathetic, yeah, sympathetic reviewer, then I would say that Leanne is being a bit of a gold digger here, but I mean, like, come on, it's Bill, for God's sakes. He doesn't exactly scream financial powerhouse, does he? Uh, and besides, the things they're buying aren't that extravagant. Maybe to someone with a three-figure income, they seem like, oh my gosh, that's so crazy that he's buying her all this stuff. But for someone like Bill, like, it's not going to put him into bankruptcy. It's fine. Plus, thanks to the helpful nerds over at the King of the Hill fan wiki, we know that the receipts shown total up to only about 326 bucks. Adjusting for inflation, that's roughly about $620 today, which, yes, is somewhat pricey for a few dates, but it's nothing like what the true gold diggers out there have their eyes on. They've got their attention focused on thousands, if not millions of dollars. Half a grand, though? I mean, come on, even I could swing that, baby. But the real sign of Leanne's easygoing attitude about money comes when Bill says that he's all tapped out. Does Leanne react with disgust or start to shy away from him until he gets his next paycheck? Hardly. If anything, she takes the opposite approach, showing that the spending spree was never a critical factor in their relationship. I'm all tapped out till my next paycheck. We even spent my mad money. Well, that's okay. Foot rubs are free. Oh, God, what is that? Yeah, what? Oh, oh, well, that's just a little fungus. Yep, in a sorry state of affairs, Bill's medical insurance with the army apparently doesn't cover his fungal medication, and he's been having to pay for all that stuff out of pocket, which obviously is no longer viable considering his tough money situation. And it's funny, you think the army of all institutions would take foot health pretty seriously considering the tough history armed forces have had with stuff like trench foot, but here we are. But now it is time for me to make my final desperate excuse for Leanne. So here we go. Deep breath. She was 100% justified in not wanting to rub Bill's moldy feet. I don't care how much two people mean to each other or how long we've been together. I ain't getting anywhere near your musty, dusty, discolored tootsies, babe. In fact, my eye was so revolted by those moldy flippers that my attention was drawn to Leanne's cool little orange wristband thingies. For some reason, I just find those things so wonderfully charming. Weird. In any case, much like how Bill felt that buying Leanne all of those gifts was necessary to continue the relationship, Leanne clearly feels the same way about massaging Billy Boy's big old gross feet. And is it all that surprising that Leanne feels this way? I mean, come on, Bill is really out here pushing the issue. You're not going to let a little fungus come between us, are you? <sighs> While Bill's behavior here in no way excuses the abuse that he gets later, and Leanne is ultimately the main person responsible for falling back into her addiction, Bill did put her into a no-win situation, which was really shitty of him to do. You're not going to let a little fungus come between us, are you? And this conflict here feels more than a little forced. Bill was formerly so ashamed of his mold problem that he screamed, Don't look at me! And even used a fake name while getting his pills, but now he's out here just flaunting those cordyceps like they're no big deal? Yeah, right. And sadly, this contrived plot point does drive Leanne to secretly sneak some beer from Hank's giant alcohol dragon's hoard. What the fuck? He's got so many in that fridge, my goodness! <clears throat> oh boy, I have seen that look before. Bill is about to die out here. <laughs> One way or the other, you lucky moldy bastard. Ah, now wait a second though, I just checked my clock and I think it is now time for the best joke of the whole episode. <laughs> Take it away, Bobby. If you want me to hold it tight, say T. If you want me to hold it real tight, say RT. That'll be our system. <sighs> All right, T. Hmm, no, actually, I changed my mind. The best joke of the episode comes when Hank realizes that his beer cans are in fact empty. Oh, Bobby, red alert! Get over to Dale's and lock the doors! Move! Oh man, my dude is really out here tapping his head, giving the signal to run to Dale's house while simultaneously hollering for Bobby to get the fuck out of here! <laughs> it is that kind of attention to detail that makes this show such a delight. And even though Hank might be panicking, Bill isn't. And why is this? 
Well, because he's about to make the smartest decision of his life, buzzing in his final answer and locking down that sweet, sweet princess. We're engaged! It was supposed to be a surprise! <clears throat> so let's just say this straight up here. I do not find domestic abuse funny, and I don't think that King of the Hill is playing the subject itself for laughs, as Hank and Peggy's horrified faces pretty much say it all. This isn't quite one of those instances where we can say like, oh, if the gender roles were reversed, then this would be a much bigger deal, because everyone around Bill is still disgusted and frightened by what is happening to him. Sure, they might have called the cops right away if Bill had been the one to hit Leanne, but this might be weird to say, but I don't know if that's true. This is a very sort of like, hey, it's not in my house, so it ain't any of my business kind of neighborhood. In fact, I'm a little surprised that Hank even bothers to try and convince Bill that the engagement itself is a bad idea. Leanne's first husband is hiding out on an oil rig in the Gulf, and he swears he's not coming ashore until I fax him her death certificate. But unfortunately, Bill is so entangled within his hopeful optimism that he thinks that love and a whole bunch of sex will solve his issues. He even goes so far as to make this frankly frightening insinuation. My house is big enough for the two of us. Maybe even more. <laughs> And if I can pull a line from the oft-forgotten show Everybody Loves Raymond, quote, If God hasn't stopped you, the government will. Huh, you know, it's really weird to hear that line delivered without 40 seconds of laugh track immediately following it. Huh. Anyway, Luann then shows up in a wig that I am pretty sure she made herself, which lends credence to an idea that I have about her beauty school chums giving her a fucked up and ugly wig when the Megalomart explosion blows her hair off. Because if Luann can make a wig that looks dead on like her mother's hairstyle, and Luann is considered a fucking moron by her teachers and classmates, then I am sure, I am certain that that sassy queen Sharona Johnson could have whipped out something stunning if she really wanted to. You better bet your fat ass that she would have done it if she wanted to. Blech. But fuck that wig, or, you know, rather, please don't, that's what Merkins are for, because now we have to hear Luann deliver the most cutting line of the whole series to her aunt. You're not my mama. Mama is my mama. Damn, that slices straight to the bone. And sadly, this is the point where Peggy's patience breaks down and she tells her niece that, hey, if Luann is going to keep making bad decisions that end up hurting her, then Peggy won't be there to offer a shoulder to cry on. Which might sound mean and callous, but Peggy has been putting in so much effort for Luann and been getting blown off every time. And hey, besides, she now has Bill at her side, a fact which she surprisingly embraces. You're gonna marry Mama? Oh, this is like a fairy tale! I'm gonna call you Stepdaddy Bill! Oh, oh they grow up so fast. They do make a rather cute father-daughter pair, one that I wish we'd seen a little bit more often through the show. But what is not cute is how Leanne is terrorizing Bill in his own house, which, again, isn't played for laughs in and of itself, but the guy's reactions to the abuse is played for laughs. I, oh, I, oh, that, that's, that's an interesting story. I, uh, you know what? I walked into a door. Wait a minute. How is that interesting? You remember at the beginning of this review when I said that Peggy was a great person for not allowing Luann and Leanne to move in together because shit like this would happen? Well, here you go. This behavior that Bill is enduring right now is what possibly could have happened to Luann, and it would have hurt even more because the woman is her mother. So this right here is the fate that Peggy spared Luann from having to deal with. But there's no time for I told you so's because finally we have arrived at the pre-engagement barbecue, one where Bill seems to be grilling with charcoal and doing so in this Agent Orange half barrel. I'm hungry. Where's the bride to be? Oh, she'll be out soon. She just has the pre-engagement party jitters. <laughs> Some kind of damn jitters. But before Hank can talk to his bumbling friend about the dangers of ingesting chemical herbicide, Leanne comes out and does what I believe is called in the bosomy land of Texas, titty magic. <gasps> Woo! Lemonade! Poor Bill. His woman is making a fool of him. It happens. Rather than focus on Leanne's drunken nudity, which, if you know me by this point, is actually pretty tough to do, can I instead point out how insane, how manically crazy it is that Nancy and John Redcorn use every social gathering fucking imaginable to just, to just hang out and be together in public? What the fuck? 
It isn't enough that those two have enough sexy times together that would make the Viltrumites envious, they also need to be seen together, out in public, flaunting themselves to everybody who can see. Ooh, how crazy that we're together, how taboo. You two are the fucking worst. And disregarding that whole nightmare, we now are able to see the full Leanne that everyone else in the neighborhood was already aware of. We are now bearing witness to the horrible slob who is totally out of control and barely seems to know where she is, what age she is, or what's even going on. Mama, please! Will you quit calling me that? I'm only 34. Honey, I'm only a few short years from being 34, and let me tell you, you ain't no fucking 34. Unless you've been drinking lighter fluid in prison, you're an easy 40, almost as easily as you are a 10 out of 10. And as she flaunts her big old badonkadonk to Buckley, who, for someone who has barely said anything in the series, decides to make a very poor choice of words. Help! Get this skank off me! And here comes the fork! Except this time, Leanne has graduated from backstabbing to face stabbing. Thankfully, just before Leanne can dig out Buckley's front teeth, we are met with a Peggy X Machina. Family little! <laughs> Excuse me, ma'am, but that was my fork. So I know I said that Leanne is a pretty strong person, but Peg just stopped that fork mid-strike and with no forward travel. Peg had that shit locked down in her iron grip, which is massively impressive. Almost as impressive as her big speech telling Leanne what is really up. Whether you like the title or not, you are this girl's mother. She has been waiting her whole life for just a shred of attention from you. I hope someday you can live without alcohol. But until that day, we can all live very nicely without you. And that's about as compassionate and firm of a message as one can get. Basically, we want you in our life, but not like this. Which sucks to say, but there does come a point where you have to put your size 16 foot down and stop the bleeding. Because being within the same family, as I'm sure some of you can sadly attest to, doesn't mean that certain people deserve to be part of your life. And blessedly, thankfully, Leanne decides to take this advice to heart and she cleans up her act and proceeds to have 10 children with Bill, whom I'm sure will be following in the reboot. Or rather, that's what could have been. Instead... Ah! I kicked your brother's ass and I will kick yours too, Stacy! Oh, my brother has got size six feet, but I don't! Oh yeah! <clears throat> you see, foot-related violence in this case was actually the answer. Peggy rocked Leanne's ass so hard that it actually broke the spell she had over Luann. Come on, me man. Let's get out of this dump. Mm -mm. Fine! Then I ain't your sister no more! That ain't the drunkenness talking. The force from Peggy's foot actually ricocheted off that booty so hard that the back shot actually gave her brain damage, which is why I'm not allowed to do that anymore. It's also the same reason why Peggy didn't kick Bobby in the fellas in the Bobby Goes Nuts episode as a little bit of revenge, because she's a mom that still very much wants grandchildren, and kicking Bobby with her size 16 feet would have made that a bit of an impossibility. And in the end, Leanne makes her escape, and we are left with a very transformed Bill. Can't just let her steal your truck, Bill. You gotta call the police. No, I, I think the best thing to do is just let her go. And if she does come back, well... <laughs> Then I'll call the police. You see, isn't this so smart? We've now come full circle. Now we're the ones with traumatic memories of Leanne and regard her presence with caution. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention, but the Peggy Luann relationship is also neatly fixed up by the ass beating, which I think is a phenomena called the comic book special. We then get an extra scene during the credit roll, which shows Luann talking to her aunt at the mother-daughter event at the Beauty Academy, showing very subtly here that Luann has actually accepted Peggy as her mother figure. Twin sisters may have the strongest bond. Mm, especially if they're attached at the head. Mm -hmm. This is perhaps not as funny of a joke to end on as the whole like, oh, well then I'll call the police line, but I do admire the utter strangeness of Peggy introducing the whole attached at the head line of reasoning, same with Bill apparently introducing Luann to people as his daughter, which, to be fair, she very nearly was. In any case, as you can tell, this was a real roller coaster of an experience. 
it's just got a little bit of everything. I mean, drama, drunkenness, dread, which y'all know I'm a big fan of. It's got deep character history, it's got lore, and it's got Dale Pepper spraying everyone. I think we can safely assume here that Hank confiscated Dale's pepper spray after this, and that's why he had to make the switch over to pocket sand. And even though this sort of falls into the category of a Bill Endlessly Suffering episode, there is certainly more than enough misery to go around and makes it feel like a more even experience. And it may surprise you to hear this, but I actually think that the first place ribbon for misery definitely goes to Leanne herself, who, unlike the rest of the cast, now has to live with herself for the rest of her days. And that, certainly, is one awful punishment. <laughs> but phew, look at us, viewer. We came out the other side of this train wreck alive. Huzzah! <laughs> what a thrill. Don't you feel so much better after getting through all that stuff? Because surely, certainly, whatever episode lies ahead of us can only be an improvement on this rough situation. Well, here's one that gets at the heart of the matter. We're all Christians here. How about you? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. That one. Okay, yeah. It's about that time. Okay, then. I will be handling that one with great joy. <laughs> and you better get ready, son, because I'm about to unload on our favorite propane boy like I have never done before. Because <laughs> Hank in that episode just, woo, he pisses me off. Like, for the first time ever, I'm actively mad at what Hank does in that episode. And will my stance against Hank piss some people off? Well, you know, I would think so, but sometimes you folks surprise me. Y'all handled the Buddha Sack episode much better than I thought you would. I was actually really impressed. But then again, you really handled the Husky Bobby one much worse than I ever could have anticipated. So we'll see how the next one goes. But until then, we can say that this episode, titled Leanne Saga, which, if you know, is a play off of Luann Saga from the first season, has indeed been reviewed to death. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next review. Hey Leanne, how's that uh, job search coming along? Not so good. My best reference just went in for chemical castration.